So damage sustained, minus 22. Damaged by artillery, minus 10. Losing currently, minus 8. Under missile fire, minus 5. But they are getting a plus 3 from their lord. But if their lord strays too far, which he's about to, because he's joining the close combat, um, this might well go down to 0. And if it goes to 0 or lower, they will break. And breaking basically means they'll get a little white flag that appears above their banner, and they will make for usually the closest um, edge of the battlefield and try to escape that way. And once they're off the edge of the battlefield, then they're out of the fight if they've they've been saved. Then there's another state called break. So if they are... Sorry, it's called chattered. If they break, so that's just the white flag, then if they get far enough away from the fight before getting off the edge of the map, they may actually recover. Their morale will start to regenerate, and then they can be sent back into the fight. And some armies, like Skaven, make heavy use of this. They get bonuses when breaking to run away, then they'll recover, get the morale back again, then you can send them back in the fight. Skaven are very much about like constantly going in, running away, going back in, running away, going back in, running away. Um, other factions, not so much. But this unit is about to break. Then if we do enough damage where they're completely shattered, then you'll get a little skull icon appearing next to the white flag, and that means that they are gone. Uh, they will retreat, they will continue retreating, there is no recovering them. Why are the Dragon Guard moving forwards? So let's not do that, guys. Sometimes archers behave weirdly. Mistress of let's just drop this slow on them. Using a spell, so we can see... Okay, this is actually a good thing to show. So we just cast a spell. So you click on the icon, you choose where you want it to go. This was a single target spell, so it can only affect a single regiment. And then this green halo shows how long that spell is active. So we have 27 seconds of that spell being in, in effect. So they are currently moving 45% slower for 27 seconds. Then after the 27 seconds, the cooldown will kick in and that green highlight will turn red. You need to wait for the red highlight to disappear, then you can cast the spell again. Meanwhile, the archers, they're running. The white flag is there. They are gone. They also have a red icon on the leadership. We are now going to select our cavalry and double click on the archers and we're going to tell them to go in and charge. Rocket launcher is still shooting at them. The we're going to select the dragon to go and attack their general. She is a bit of a dragon uh, general killer. And in fact, you know what? Let's, let's go into dragon mode. We're going to press the special ability that makes her into a dragon. And there she goes. And then we're going to wait a second for her to become active again. We're going to tell her to attack their general. And off goes the dragon. So the cavalry is currently charging after the peasant archers. But if we hover, if we have the cavalry selected and we hover over the forest, we can see that there is an impact here. Melee attack minus, uh, I'm sorry, melee attack is set to 80% and speed is set to 80% because it's a large unit. Cavalry do not like being in the woods. So as they're traversing through this, they are slowed down. Similarly, units, small units in the water, if you just hover over the water, we can see that they have the same penalties in shallow water because they're basically wading. Big units, though, if you hover over the water, no impact. They don't care. You could see it in some of the newer games, uh, KD Ports. I think from Warhammer 2. And here we go, we have our cavalry charging. Whoa, we just shot, we just killed half of our... Okay, so friendly fire. Friendly fire is a thing. You probably want to tell the artillery to stop shooting. Uh, otherwise they will kill half of your own unit. <laughs> so that was a great example of Mordred and cavalry. Mordred and cavalry, this happens. I am not a very good cavalry commander. So instead we're going to tell the rocket launcher to shoot into that. Uh, this is a bit danger close. Hopefully at this range is going to be pretty accurate and it's going to be able to shoot back here. In fact, what we might even want to do is say expressly aim towards the back of this unit so you're not going to be hitting my guys in front. What was I explaining? Right, so these cavalry that are charging will have the charge bonus active. I do kind of wish there was a an icon or something to say that charge bonus is in effect, but there isn't. And we have victory. So all of their units are now shattered. So you remember, we see the white flag with the skull. White flag and skull means they ain't coming back. So I'm just going to tell these guys to just keep on shooting. Stop shooting. 
and we're going to keep an eye on the cavalry. And what we can do at this stage is just speed the battle up. So up here we have movement, so you have pause, you have half move if you're like trying to aim stuff, play, forward, and then fast forward. Because we're just trying to kill as many of these units as we can. In fact, we should have the dragon go to kill their general, and cavalry go to kill the remnants of those long spears. And once you're in dragon mode, you can see we've lost all access to magic. So she can only use magic when she is in human mode. Similarly with the special ability, the only ability she has is transform back into a human. Your guard mode is clearly not working because you've been running after these guys. That's not normal effect. <laughs> and as a general rule, when you have a unit hovered, Reducing their number of units to 10 or less, I say, is usually good enough. So once they have 10 or less units in a... Uh, sorry, 10 or less models in a unit, then the fight's over. In fact, you know what? Let's talk about models. So when we click on a unit, we can see for ourselves that we have a number here. That's not the health, that's the number of soldiers in that unit. So this Celestial Dragon Guard currently has 119 troops. They have a maximum of 120. Which we can see here. So they have 119 out of 120. They have lost a little bit of health, that's probably that one guy dying. Some units, for example the Sky Junk, will have just one model. That means that this one guy has almost 10,000 hit points. It's pretty tough. And you will sometimes see like a model of, sorry, a unit with say 16 models, like Ogres or uh, Trolls or something like that. They'll have a lot of hit points but fewer models. Each individual model will have their own hit point counter. You can't see it yourself, but you can usually get a pretty good idea. And the game will track the amount of hit points of each of those models. So if you have, for example, cannons shooting at trolls, if enough cannonballs hit the same troll, that troll is going to die. But if you do damage spread over the, the unit, then each of those models is going to take a portion of damage, uh, but you may not actually kill any. So even though you're reducing their hit points massively, none actually die. And then once everything is shattered and you're done chasing them, you can just press any battle. Which we will do. Then you can save a replay, you can fight the battle again if you want to save your cavalry. Or you can just press end battle. And we're done. So we lost 10 units. As it turns out, the damage that we did to our cavalry was spread. Because rocket launchers do area of effect damage, they don't do single target damage. So... We didn't actually lose any, well, we lost like one model, not half the arm, not half the unit. Uh, the other thing we can see here is kills. So we can see that this unit of cavalry got 134 kills, mostly because they were chasing down fleeing units. The rocket launcher got 55. Um, it doesn't count for any fire in that. And then their archer was the only guy to actually kill something. So we lost 10 men, only one to enemy fire, which means that 90% um, of the damage we took was friendly. That is the downside to having very good artillery. <laughs> but there is the victory. We can see that the unit cards have turned grey. If they're grey, then that unit is dead. That is something you'll always want to check. If a unit has taken a lot of damage, you want to see, is it grey? No, it's not grey? Okay, we're good. Otherwise, you'll probably need to replace it. Then, at the end of the battle, you can get another rundown of how everything did. And then three choices. This is what you do with the captives. So you can execute them, which will give you some leadership. You can venerate them which will mean that they will join your army effectively or in this case you venerate the ancestors and get more recruitment which will replenish units so you can get some units back or you can pardon them this will reduce your casualty replenishment so the speed at which you recover soldiers will go down for a turn but you gain some money uh, in this instance i am probably going to go for pardoning the captives we didn't lose very much i'm not too bothered about losing casualty replenishment for a turn and we'll gain some extra money and then that is army no is gone. And mission accomplished. So we have gained a thousand ducats and we have recruited the Astromancer. Enemy killed a battle, Tangji Deng. Done. Mission issued. A hero comes. Send your new hero to join the army. Powerful heroes such as the Astromancer can act independently. For now, get them to join your army. So we're going to go over here to... Oh, hang on. Before we do that, the we're going to rename this Sky Junk to Mastani. So Mastani Sky Junk. Um, so, yeah. One of my... 
subscribers on Twitch has redeemed one of the channel rewards, which is renaming a unit, and they requested that we rename the Sky Junk, so we have now done that. Um, the other thing is, if you click on these unit cards outside of the battle, you can see that there are a bunch of options here. So you can rename them, you can rename any units in the game. I very often do that with heroes, which we'll probably do in just a moment with Yu Tang. You can disband the unit, which just gets rid of them. You don't get anything back, so be careful when you're doing this. Um, and then finally have merged units. So if, for example, several Jade Warrior units are taking damage, we could merge them so that all of the um, health would be concentrated in turn. Instead of having multiple partially damaged, you would have one damaged. However, this can delete units that have complete damage. So if we had three units and we were missing 120 units between those three and then we consolidate, one of those units would disappear as we consolidate everything else into the remaining two. Feel like such a jerk. Amy asked me to make lunch. Pleaded all sweet and kind. Uh, bitched and gripes and came back and found that she bought you Warhammer 3. Whoops. <coughs> Is there shift consolidate like E4? No. It's all or nothing. So, new mission. Send your new hero to join the army. Okay. The dragon needs you. So we need to recruit two more units. We'll do that in just a moment. Restore harmony. Cathayan factions should strive to maintain stability between the forces of yin and yang. Achieving balance leads to rewards, while extreme imbalances can cause unrest and other debilitating effects. So we've already talked about that yin and yang, but it's saying if we get to harmonious, which is zero yin, um, then we would gain some money. But right now, what we're going to do is we're going to click on Yutang Nanmen, which A you can see is another banner here. Uh, heroes will have this square banner, whereas armies will have the rectangular one. Heroes also don't have the banner physically being Pride carried by them, uh, unlike you. They will also have icons on top of them. So right now, Yutang Nanmen being an astromancer is spreading control in this region. This is an active ability that's always going to be active if they're in an army on the campaign map. And they may well get other abilities as well which will be reflected on top. So Yutan Nan Men. Uh, we're going to click on you. We're going to rename you. And I'm just going to rename you very quickly after a subscriber. This is going to be... Garius the Brit. There we go. So we have a new hero named after Garius the Brit. Now, before we do anything else, actually, the I want to talk about experience and daughter. stats. So you can see here, we were talking earlier about the, the ones on the battlefield, the pre-battle map. Well, that's experience. And if we click on that right now, so if we have a lord selected or just an army selected, it'll be for you if you have a hero selected, it'll be for the hero. You can click on there, the and then we get the skill tree. So as we level up, Every time this blue bar finishes, this number will go up. Every time the number goes up, we gain skill points, which will be shown up here. We can then spend those skill points on buffing various attributes for our hero. And those are all of these. And you can see that we need these to then unlock these. Then we need a certain number of these in the boxes to unlock the next tier, and so on. Unfortunately, we haven't leveled up yet, so I can't show you precisely how everything is colorized because everything is gray so you know what actually we'll come back to that later uh so in the meantime i'm going to click on garius just like the armies heroes can move on the the, the map so we can move them around the if we wanted to win. the maximum extent of their movement is shown by the green they don't have stances stances are an army only thing then if we, we have garius selected and we hover over meow ying we see the two crossed arrows this is basically a merge command so we're going to tell him to merge with meow ying Heroes have army abilities where they will buff the army that they are with, and his ability is scouting. This will increase the parent army's chance of finding a magic item after winning a battle by 10%. So just by Garius being in this army, we will gain this ability. Celestial artifacts shall be mine. And we can see that his uh, spread control is now on top of the army banner to say, this is still active, this is a forever active capability, as long as you're in friendly territory. Plus, we are now increasing the... Uh, magic item find chance. So we have succeeded in this. We gained 500 ducats. That is another mission done. 
Okay, the next mission was to recruit some new units. So we're going to select Miao Ying. Then we're going to press this button down here, recruit units. Now this is something you can only do in friendly territory. So you can see here on the map, this line. Green is your own territory, red is enemy. If we cross over, is not then this becomes unavailable. You can't recruit anymore. We go back to our own territory, one. then there are now units available for recruitment. We are in the Gunpowder Road. The Gunpowder Road is our local region. You will always want to recruit in the local region if possible. Because the units there will take less time to recruit. We can see the number of turns it takes to recruit. So it's just one turn. So at the start of the next turn, they'll be available. Uh, the amount of money it costs to recruit them. And then their upkeep. Upkeep's always the same, regardless of where you recruit them. You can also recruit from a global recruitment thing. So if we, for example, took the Terracotta Graveyard, which is in a different region, we a different province, we could use the global recruitment to recruit units from Nangao, which would probably give us access to the gunners, the Iron Hail gunners. Um, but they will cost a lot more because they're basically having to travel from Nangao to join us automatically over here. So where possible, recruit locally. And you know what? I kind of fancy having some gunners, so we're going to go ahead and queue the up two of those. And you can see that we have the red squares here. Usually they are black, that means they are blank. We're not recruiting anything, we're going to recruit two units. That is our recruitment capacity for this turn. So every turn we can recruit up to two people. And it will show us here. We can queue up when more. Asks, and we can see now that it's going to take two turns to recruit. Because this is basically using the capacity for next turn after that to then recruit the next the set of them. We're just going to queue up two. And that will be just fine. Uh, next thing we need to do is check our technology. So we can a see that we have a exclamation mark over the technology button. So we're going to go ahead and click this. So this is Cathay's tech tree. Cathay's tech tree is quite different from... Um, other factions in that this is also split into yin and yang so if you go with the top part of the tech these are all yang whenever you get one of these technologies your yang harmony will increase if you go for the bottom ones then yin will increase and then if you go for the middle ones neither so the middle is balanced generally although actually if you go off, off the sides of the middle then they're not right now we are plus four yin so we want to use technology to basically balance that and get us back into harmony. So we're going to go and get some of the Yang technologies, which interestingly is going to be mostly close combat stuff. So we're going to be buffing our close combat abilities by going Yang, even though our general being Yin and her leader effects are going to be mostly this. So if we really wanted to buff up our archers, we could. It just means that we would be getting even more Yin, which is not necessarily a good thing. And in fact, you can see now that we've gone to the next stage of the penalty so our construction cost for yang buildings has gone down even further the income from yang buildings has gone up even further but the income penalty from yin is going down and we are now losing control because we have moved too far towards yin we are very out of harmony so we're going to go ahead and get drill training this is going to increase the leadership for all peasant long spears doesn't matter when you recruit them you get them automatically and yang harmony is going to increase it'll take four turns to do but that's fine for the defense that is how you do effort. technology Can you turn off friendly fire? I don't think so, no. You just aim more carefully. How much should you spend on a PC to play this game? As much as you are comfortable spending. Just gonna double check to see if I missed anything. Don't think so. Duckets. Wait, is this a very new mod for E4? No, I just like using buckets of ducats. Steam Workshop support is coming for Warhammer 3. CA is working on a modding kit at the moment. I mean, all of the other Total War games have modding support, so I'm not that surprised that it would be coming. Though I'm a little surprised it's not already here. Uh, Jackson wants me to drink some tea. Cheers. L. Doyle. T. The. Huff. And Tusum. Thank you very much for the follows. Welcome to the channel. Okay. So one of the nice things that Total War does is this icon here, which is usually the Anton uh, icon, will tell you notifications. So if we can click on this, it's saying, hey, there is something else you need to do. So we're going to click on that and it's saying, Nangao needs to build some buildings. And that is true. We do need to build some buildings in Nangao. So Nangao is the only settlement we own at the moment. We can take a look at the mini-map here and we can see that we there is just the one green castle. So we can click on it and this will bring up the province overview. 
Now, this is an important distinction. A province is all of the settlements present in one area. So the province of the Gunpowder Road consists of the regions of Nangao, the mines of Yat Nanyan, and Nanli. So Nanyan is here, and then Nanli is here. Once we control all three of them, we will get what's called an edict, and that's going to allow us to access these, which is a way of basically specializing what that province is producing. Now, the distinction is important because a number of the bonuses from the buildings you can build will affect either the province, the faction, which is everything, or the region. So if we click on Nangao, we can then hover over this. This is saying that this is an empty construction slot. That's what that icon means, and we can build something, which means we can actually afford to build something here. And then we get this list of buildings, which we can just hover over, and then it gives us a drop-down of which each of those are. Or we can use the building browser, which is this button here. So whichever region is currently active, and if we own the other regions, we can click on those as well. So whichever is active, we click on the building browser, and that will show us everything we can build in that region. And that's an important one to note, because sometimes a region will have a strategic building. And that's what this is, a strategic location. So the name bar will give you a variety of very useful bits of information. First of all, the owner. The flag will differ depending on who owns each thing. Uh, the ruin means that this is currently a ruin. Nobody owns it. Probably. Then we have the name. We have whether it's a provincial capital, which means it has walls. If it's the first in this list and if it has this icon, it's the province capital, which generally means it's a walled settlement, so it will require a siege to attack, as opposed to a town, which or a village rather, which will not require a siege, but will have a town battle. Then we have the hammer. That means that there is something present here that can be built. We then have the train type. So this is a suitable climate, which is the green ring. It's savannah. That means we, we like this. We can build here. No problems. If, however, we go over to the Fortress of Eyes over here in the Chaos Wastes, no. we can see it's a red ring. Uninhabitable climate. We can take this. This is the one, uh, one of the changes between Warhammer 2 and 3 versus Warhammer 1, where you absolutely just couldn't settle areas that were uninhabitable. Now you can, but you will take all of the penalties which are outlined. So generally, building up in an uninhabitable climate is not a good idea. There are basically two scales. So you have suitable, which is everywhere that you favour, no penalties. You have unsuitable, like up here in the mountains, which will give us a couple of penalties, but usually you can balance that out if it's a particularly strategically important location. And then you have the unsuitables, which is pretty much worthless turf. You don't really want to bother with that. If you can get a vassal or something which can uh, settle these areas, you may want to give them those settlements, or an ally and give them those settlements. But uh, for us, we don't. And you can see everything which is suitable, so we can click over here. Uh, this is like your faction overview. So if you click on the ruler oh, of the northern provinces, we can see here climates. And it will give you an outline of all the different types of climates in the game. So we can inhabit quite happily temperate, savanna, and desert. These are the ones we like. Unpleasant are wasteland, mountain, temperate island, and jungle. So we'll have some penalties there, but we could still live there if we have to. Then uninhabitable. We can set up a settlement there, but it's going to be a useless settlement. So that is going to be frozen. It's magical forest, ocean, and chaotic wasteland. So the chaotic wasteland is what's outside our walls. That is uninhabitable. Will this part where you describe all of this stuff undeserved. be coming out on YouTube even if the game itself does not? Yes, this one is definitely going up on YouTube. In fact, this will probably be the first proper series on YouTube as opposed to just the pod. Um, right, what else do I need to talk about? Buildings. So if we go back to the building browser, let's talk about the different building types. So you can see that each of them is broadly categorized. We've got landmarks, we've got resource, we've got basic military, we've got advanced military, we've got defense. In fact, we weren't finished here. This is important because if a area has a strategic location, which is this monument icon. And these are fairly rare. You'll see that there aren't very many places with the monument icon. If you hover over the monument, it'll say who it's for. This location is of special importance to Cathay. That means that Nangao can build something which is completely unique to Cathay. If you are not playing as a Cathay faction, you can't build this unique building. So if we go back to the building browser and we go to the landmark category, we can see that it's the ninth wall. We could build the ninth wall once we have a level five city. 
and 10,000 ducats, which will give us a bunch of defensive capabilities. So it'll make this place basically a really big citadel and very, very, very hard for enemies to conquer. Uh, that is the landmark. And then next to that, we have resources. So in Nangao, we produce pottery. Most places don't have a resource. Mines of Nanyang, nothing. Terracotta Graveyard, nothing. Uh, the gates are unique.